Welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. My name is Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on December 7th with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation entitled Remember Pearl Harbor, Finding Your Ancestors in World War II Military Records. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Roger P. Minert, who will be giving a presentation on cemeteries in Central Europe. Before we begin, here's a little bit about Roger. Roger P. Minert received his doctoral degree from The Ohio State University in German Language History and Second Language Acquisition Theory. He taught German language and history for 10 years and then became a professional family history researcher. Accredited by the Family History Library for research in Germany and Austria, he worked for 12 years as a private genealogical researcher. From 2003 to 2019, he served as a professor of family history at Brigham Young University. The author of 208 publications, he directs the research program German Immigrants in American Church Records, and the series now consists of 38 volumes. In 2019, Minor was recognized for his years of service to the Palatines to America Society and also received the Shirley Reimer Lifetime Achievement Award from the International German Genealogy <clears throat> Partnership. And we'll now turn the time over to Roger to share his screen. Guten Tag. It's a pleasure to be part of this again. And Olivia will tell me, of course, if I'm not properly being heard. My fascination with cemeteries goes way, way back. In fact, clear back to high school, where I spent two years working in the Brigham City Cemetery, two summers. Loved that immensely. What a beautiful cemetery that is. My job was to mow around each stone. We had about 5,000 at the time. After the big guys rolled through, they couldn't get really close with their six-foot spread. So I'd go down the rows one by one, all four, you know, across the front, side, back, side, front, and on to the next one. So anyway... So, yes, I could have gone insane in those uh, eight-hour summer days, mowing around all those stones. But I developed a fun arithmetic technique to figure out how old a person was. I'd memorized the birth and death dates as I went across the front. And by the time I got around the four sides, back to the front, I could tell how many years, months, and days a person had lived. Well, I was not a family historian at the time. Genealogy was not something that... that intrigued me until after my admission in Germany. But what I'd like to do is show you a bunch of pictures and talk about them. You can read about all these details in the two attachments that Olivia will be sending out to all of you. So this is the only way I've ever done a seminar. I mean, this is the only time I've ever done a seminar this way. Otherwise I have official PowerPoints, but this just turned out to be fun. And to keep my mind on the topic, my wife and I just recently finished an 18-month mission in Frankfurt, Germany. We lived on the 12th floor of a big apartment building. And across the street, about 200 meters away, was Frankfurt's largest cemetery. And we'll be seeing some pictures of that. So cemeteries are all in, always in my focus somehow. So anytime we're traveling, especially through the Midwest, if we go by a cemetery, Jeannie says, we don't have to stop here, do we? And she she tolerates that. I might say, I really have to see the cemetery. Give me five minutes. So, well, here we go. In Germany, we have very different customs and regulations, for that matter, regarding funerals and burial practices. So very, very different from our own, but it's important for us to get to know them. You may be thinking the bottom line is, how do I use cemeteries for family history research? We will be answering that question toward the end. You may have come up with the answer before we get to the end because you're paying good attention. This is from the Frankfurt Cemetery. I had, I scheduled a 15 minute conversation with the director of this enormous cemetery. He has a huge staff, as you can imagine. The cemetery's size 
very close for that matter to the campus of BYU, many, many acres. There are thousands upon thousands of, of graves there and lots of places for additional. So as you're, if you happen to need the services of a cemetery, if you happen to choose this particular cemetery as a resident of Frankfurt, a non-resident, uh, you pay different higher fees if you're a non-resident, but if you're officially registered in Frankfurt, then you pay lesser fees. This is one of six pages of fees regarding uh, what kind of spot do you have? Do you have a spot where you can only have a flat stone, an upright stone in a very prestigious part of the cemetery in sort of a blue collar part or a middle class part? All of these designations are available. And of course they have fees for digging out the grave, opening, opening the grave for that matter, and then for staging the funeral and for closing the grave, whether it be a casket or an urn, in the case of your friends and relatives who are cremated. You can also engage the use of a beautiful, gigantic funeral chapel there on the spot, because most people don't have funerals in churches. That's not common at all in Germany. So you have to rent that facility. I still remember one of my friends saying, well, we buried my mother a couple months ago, and I told everyone in the program that was held in the funeral ch the chapel at the cemetery, we've got to cut this program off at exactly 29 minutes because you pay by the half hour. And if we go 31, you have to pay for any portion of the next half hour. So I'm back there giving signals to people, cut your funeral oration short. we got to make the 29-minute cutoff. Very funny. By the way... Olivia can can take your chats at any time. Mm -hmm. If your question is right on top of our topic here, all she needs to say is, uh, uh, Roger, we have a question from Helen in Dubuque, Iowa. And I'll say, go ahead with your question, Helen, because we have plenty of time to do this. In, ge in good German fashion, you would expect to see rules for your conduct on the cemetery property. I think I've seen some of those in, in the United States as well. We basically know you're not having parties in the cemetery. You're not hooting and hollering and yelling at each other. But look at this list of, good heavens, how many of there? Five rules, and the fifth one has six sub-rules. Just to let you know, you're in Germany, and there are rules for everything. I love this. One of these me medieval designs on the back. The other side, of, of course, has the person's name. But this reminds you of the tradition of a thousand years ago, where people used to always say, memento mori, remember that you must die. Life doesn't go on forever. Death totentans, the dance of death, is a favorite thing where you have skeletons. Between every two skeletons in a long line is the mayor and a farmer and a tinker or a housewife. And the message is always, you're going to die. Don't forget that. This could happen at any time. Sort of macabre image. I haven't seen this kind of thing in American cemeteries. Now, here's how this works. The grave is opened here by our grave worker. He has dug down here. The standard depth is, in fact, just under two feet down. And uh, traditionally, you get exactly two meters wide I'd say one meter wide, two meters long. That means six feet, seven inches long and 39 inches wide. They'll go down about six feet. Now he's just piling up the dirt right there. He's hauled off some of it. But now the job he's got is to put the greens out there to, make, to cover up the dirt. Don't want to see that. And then place the flowers in appropriate locations. So I happen to come at the perfect time to watch him do this because I collect pictures of this process in different cemeteries, different countries. Now, what are the ropes for? Remember the cowboy shows, the, the old 19th century shows on TV or movies where they lower the casket down with ropes? Well, they do that in many cemeteries in Germany still. So the casket will be placed not on one of those metal formations there with belts going across, 
or they crank it down after the ceremony. No, they'll put the casket on the two two by fours. And when it's time to lower the casket, the members of the company will, let's see, six of them, six men or whichever people are selected, will grab the ends of the ropes. Somebody pulls the two, uh, two boards out and then they slowly lower the casket into the ground. Now I ask the director of this huge Frankfurt cemetery if they use the mechanical device. He said, no, I prefer the ropes. We use the ropes throughout the cemetery. Other cemeteries in Germany have gone with the mechanical device because one person can do the work there. But he says, I like the, his the historic atmosphere of doing it that way. Now, everything's set up. The greens are there. And we have these metal platforms that people could stand on because if the graves to either side have been open, Mother Nature doesn't compact dirt like it originally was. So they've got to be very careful to not let that fall in. If you're really wealthy, you get to have a, a, a Cadillac hearse. This was actually taken downtown Luxembourg City. And this would be a Catholic situation because everybody in Luxembourg City essentially is Catholic. So now processions do not take people from a funeral home to the cemetery, except in rare occasions, maybe a state funeral. If a former chancellor of Germany died, they might do that. But they don't like to shut down traffic in their congested cities while people very slowly move along in a long, long snake line to the cemetery. By the way, the body is generally taken to the funeral home where no embalming takes place. Extremely rare situations, extremely famous persons, and gypsies. Gypsies prefer embalming, but nobody else does. I've talked to funeral directors who've never done embalming. They wouldn't know how to do it in many cases. So that's simply not part of it. The basic idea in all of Germany, in German, I should say, Central European burial and cemetery practices is ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The caskets, we'll talk about that in a minute. So essentially the body is taken from the hospital or from whatever the location of the, the death is to a funeral home where they keep the body under cool conditions and dress the body for the burial. And the people go there to select the casket. And you can do this, by the way, in advance. One of our missionaries over there is from a family in Eastern Germany, not, not too far from Berlin, where they run a family funeral home since the 1960s, about 50 years. And I got to visit with them right here in Provo. This uh, former missionary brought his parents over here and they wanted to go to a big funeral home to compare practices, to see the facilities. And it was really interesting because they were asking, well, now, what do you do about this? What do you do about that? And our host at the funeral home here asked them, well, in Germany, do you do this? Do you do that? How do you manage these situations? Really fascinating. That took an hour and a half just a couple of months ago. This is a funeral chapel, very small one. Essentially, every cemetery is now a city cemetery, a communal cemetery, but there are historic cemeteries where, where burials no longer take place. Those belong to Jewish communities, they belong to Catholics, they belong to Lutherans. But with the growing cities around 1900, more and more cities were saying, we can't devote this much room in the middle of town to a cemetery. So they established a new cemetery in the edge of town. That's traditionally where you go now. If you go to the cemeteries around the church, you generally won't find any stones except those for burials many, many years ago. And in some cases, the stones have been removed. The metal markers, the wooden markers have been removed because those rust and rot over time. And you may see the only stones embedded in the exterior wall of the church. Those are the pastors. Those are the very rich patrons. So that's also very, very different. In many cases, there might be a small patch of grass around the church on three sides. Now, in smaller towns, they can still have those cemeteries. But in that case, only members, uh, uh, 
people affiliated with that religion may be buried there. And we'll talk about reusing burial spots. Now, I couldn't take this too obviously, but these are men, older men in all cases, carrying a casket out of that little place we saw a second ago. And not for an instant what I consider walking in there, taking a picture of this very short funeral, probably a 29 minute funeral. So now here they are at the very end. At the grave, I saw the cemetery worker preparing just a few hours earlier. I came back at this time, said, come back at about such and such time. These are all old people. So, and they're actually bearing a casket. Now, the majority of Germans now uh, avail themselves of cremation. It costs a whole lot less. It's convenient. And in many cases, people are saying, well, we don't live anywhere close to mom and dad. You know, they were both over the, over 90 and we've all moved far away. We don't need a grave anymore. So, so put the, uh, put the urn in an urn, a, a wall, a memorial wall made specifically for these spots. The Provo Cemetery has one. It's brand new about four or five years ago. So now when it's done, the people leave and quite often they'll go to a local tavern. They'll go to a public house and go to a restaurant and they'll have coffee and kuchen and they'll do that for a couple hours and show you. And just like you know, in the LDS audience as we go back to church and we have this big dinner with, with our funeral potatoes I met some people uh, one of our dear friends died just a week and a half ago and three Lutheran sisters from North Dakota came and they said we've heard about funeral potatoes will we be having those tomorrow I said yes you will I wonder if they like the funeral potatoes. Okay, so this is how they leave the scene. The casket's in the ground. There is no vault. You might have noticed that when we looked at the grave. There is no vault. Vaults are not allowed, except in rare instances. And nobody, you ask Germans about vaults, they don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. A concrete box for the casket? Why would you want that? Well, in America, the name of the game is Preserve everything as long as possible. Because of that, we have cemeteries with stones back to the 16 and 1700s. That's just about unheard of in Germany, as we'll talk about here in detail. So now what happens next? Here comes the worker. And he instantly said, pardon me for standing on the casket, but this is the only way I can access all the stuff I need. He takes all the ropes out so they can reuse them. Then he will remove the crucifix. No parts of this casket may be metal. Now, if they are, he will remove metal handles. Okay? And he will remove that crucifix because, once again, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So he doesn't mean to deface the coffin or damage it in any way. He's got rubber shoes, but this is where he has to be to do his work. So he removes all the greens. And as soon as he's done that, dirt right on top of the casket. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And with Germany's humid soil, you, almost, you can hardly see a rock anywhere in that soil. That breakdown process is going to begin immediately. And usually it will take no more than 10 years before the casket breaks down. You can use, by the way, whatever wood you want, no metal. And inside the casket, Nothing that will not break down easily. Therefore, no silks, no satins, only cloth, and it could be color colored. And of course, people's clothing, you know, there'll be buttons and things like that. Those are those are not forbidden. But it won't take very long be before Mother Nature with water breaks down the wood, the casket collapses, and the ground above sinks. Now that may be a macabre image to you but I'll show you a picture of that later on. When that happens, the cemetery people who are who are seeing everything every day will notice that they'll bring in soil and level it up again, maybe a couple times. So this is the burial process. <clears throat> in Switzerland, I don't really like this much because you basically, in many cases, cannot be buried next to your spouse unless you die together, which is a rare thing. Switzerland graves are traditionally chronological. They put them in rows. March 1st, March 3rd, March, March 6th, March 10th, 
just in a row. And most people will not be buried anywhere close to where their dear spouse is or mothers or anybody else. Uh, you can, in some cases, buy family plots. Germans can, too. They can buy family plots. Now, the first markers that go up are provided generally by, by the funeral home. And they're simple. They're wood. They're inscribed in painted letters. They're not going to last very long. But the assumption is that after a few months, the family will come by and say, we've engaged a monument maker, and he'll place the monument. Now, notice the dirt is right there quite visible. That's going to settle down when the casket eventually is corrupted and loses its integrity. Now, in this one day, I was traveling with some people. We were looking at ancestral locations. And a lady said, get to the cemetery as fast as you can. It's such and such holiday here in Switzerland. And everybody's going to be dressed up in their finest, especially the ladies. You've got to see it. So we raced over there, and they were gorgeous, beautiful. These costumes of local variety will identify a person. An expert can look at the lady and say, she's actually not from this town. She's from 10 miles away from that other town because of the precise detail of her attire. It's a great thing. Germans have it too, mostly in the South. Austria has it everywhere. But as you move north, all the way to Frankfurt, now I've got seven, I have six beautiful coats of that variety and one three-piece suit. But I wouldn't wear any of them in Frankfurt because once you get up into the middle part of Germany, people don't wear those to church. In Austria, they'd say, oh, Trachten's on top. On coming Sunday, everybody wear your festive stuff. And it was so fun to do that. Very wealthy people can lease family plots. These are all leased. They're leased for generally 30 years, except in very large cities. Frankfurt leases these for only 20 years. In smaller towns, 30, in some cases 25. And you'll be given the opportunity after that, and you're paying a yearly fee. It's not very much, $30, $40. And you're keeping these up yourself. I better get to that pretty soon. But after the, let's say, 30 years in a small town, we'll get a letter saying, would you like to renew the lease for another 30 years? And people, some people say, well, gosh, we live here. This is we've, we've always lived here forever, so we're going to renew the lease. Other people might say, well, you know, we've all moved far away. I mean, from Frankfurt, um, two brothers, Hamburg, München, Berlin, France, United States. There's just really nobody there to take care of this. We don't want to spend all the money, so we'll let it go. Now, if they let it go, the property can be reused again. But in this case, with these super wealthy people and this marble lid, it's literally a marble lid. You take the lid off, and there are two, usually two spaces in there. So if Grandma dies or great grandma dies, they can take that lid off, remove one of the coffins. Uh, yes, these are concrete boxes, or these are marble boxes or stone of, of some kind, and they're waterproof. So people are in there dry. This is the only flat cemetery section I've ever seen in Germany. And you might remember in some places, in the, oh, let's see, Orem Cemetery, I believe, up on the hillside, only in rare cases can you have an upright, upright stone. The idea there is they want to roll their lawnmowers right across there, and they wouldn't have to do what I did in, in the Brigham City Cemetery as a youth, going around the stones. So they decided, well, that we'll do this. And this is the, you're looking at the entire flat section in the Frankfurt cemetery, not close to 1% of that cemetery, but they're trying it out. And some people say, well, that's all right with us. Now here they can't plant flowers. Now the flowers over to the right and in the center back a ways, those are artificial flowers. They can't, they're not allowed to plant flowers here. Oh, let's go back for a second. Let's talk more about upkeep. Within the borders of these two spots, you can see the stone border to the left and the left foreground and left background and right foreground. You can't see them back behind the flowers to the right. 
But people bring those in on their own. They pull the weeds, they plant the flowers. You can plant bushes, you can plant smaller trees. Cemeteries have regulations about that. But you've got to take care of these things. So somebody has to come by here relatively often. And this is one of the great traditions. I still can't bring myself to take a picture of a lady in a cemetery walking around. I don't want to be disrespectful, but basically any time of day on a decent weather day, you can go to a cemetery and somebody there, almost guaranteed an old lady, will be watering the plants, will be picking the leaves, just organizing things. Oh, I remember going with my German, my adopted German aunt who called me on the phone this morning. She's 88 in terrible health. I just wish she could die. She's been a widow for 41 years. Great member of the church. I love her dearly. Went to the cemetery once and she it was in the fall. She carefully picked off the grave, every leaf that had fallen from the trees. I've got another story to talk about here. Now, if you don't want to take care of this, if you move away, you can engage a garden service and pay them, and they'll come by and they'll they'll come by probably every week. They'll check things out, and in the spring they'll plant new flowers, in the fall they'll remove the dead ones. I still don't figure out what the perennials and the annuals are in this world, but my wife can tell you that. So on we go. Now, what about stones? Look at the variety of the stones here. Compare this to Beasley Monument here in, in Provo. Nothing is wild and crazy. Look at the curves on this one here to the left. So, and flowers all around this one inscribed. You can pick out what you want. And now you can pick out this plain ones that would go flat. And here's one that looks like a Bible opened and granite marble something that stands up well you're not allowed to put in what you think is going to be permanently made of wood or metal those will rust those will rot so pretty expensive about the same as what we pay here for that matter these people are wouldn't surprise you beasley monument and provo right across the street from the provo cemetery very very convenient for everybody involved so same as the situation here By the way, if you drive down, I think, 33rd South, somewhere around 6th or 7th or 8th or 9th East, Hans Monument. That's Hans Monument. The Germans, Hans. Oh, Rittlinger. If you know Trudy Schenk, that greatest of all genealogists in the Family History Library, her brother, Hans, established that business. He died just a few years ago. But he was trained as a stonemason in Germany, and he established a monument company right there. A favorite among the Germans in the valley, of course. So now this cemetery is a monument to a foregone, a disappeared town. I had a friend in Ohio once who said, Trace my ancestry back. And I got to a situation where I couldn't find them on the map. What is going on here? Well, after a long search and lots of letters, I determined that the town had been removed with six other towns. When in 1938, the German army needed a, an artillery base to fire on a big hill. So they evacuated a couple square miles. And this would have been a heartbreaker. Some army guy goes to the town and posts these notices on the telephone poles. Evacuate, evacuation of all homes and businesses in like six months from now. You'll be paid. This is an eminent domain thing. And we know we never get the money that's worth your cemetery will be maintained and you'll be allowed to come back to the cemetery one time per year from now on in perpetuity. You will bury no other persons here, but we will maintain all graves. So after months and months of doing this on one of my research tours, I got permission to visit the cemetery just to see what is going on and to drive the territory. We drove the area. All of the buildings had been raised. We found fragments of stone and of brick all over the different roads and they were literally firing their howitzers and their cannon from the positions of the towns onto a big hill nearby so but th this is interesting because every year people still gather here anybody who used to live in this town will come and gather here 
and walk around and see the graves of grandma, grandpa, great grandma, great grandpa, and they'll elect an honorary mayor for the next year. This is very common. They also do it in places like Poland, Czech Republic, where German populations used to be. They have the annual cemetery day, trying to keep the memory of the towns alive. Here's an Urnenmauer. This is the memorial wall where Amelia Robert puts in the bottom left. There's room in there for several urns. I don't know, two, four, six, eight, I have no idea. So, and then the city plants, the flowers are all the same. You'll find one of those in almost every cemetery now, even small cemeteries will have those because more and more people, even in towns where they could easily have a spot, don't want to spend the money for the casket and everything else. Gorgeous location in Austria. I took a picture of this cemetery because modern burials can take place here. There's enough room around this Catholic church that locals, so basically only the people still there, attending the church there can be buried. Now, this is this is put up by the church. This is an odd one because it's a, a metal triangle here as part of a monument. Uh, the church can allow that to happen, but it's got a shelf life. Well, here's another one. If you paint this and keep good care of it, it could last for generations. But you might think this is maybe the most important part of the picture because if you know this is Peber, then you know these horses in their third year have turned to gray and white. And a couple of years from now, they'll be doing the Vienna Riding School, the Royal Lippers and Stallions in downtown Vienna. This is where they're born. And you can take a tour up here of the places where they're raised and given their first training. Well, on we go. If you're really rich and famous, like Otto von Bismarck, von Bismarck Trönhausen, long, long, long name, then the state will bury you in your own mausoleum, a little funeral chapel for only them, and Johanna von Puttkammer, both of these people from ennobled families, he dies in 1898, after a long, long life, I think he was born in 1815, of state service, also the, fa the father of social programs in Germany, that spread to other countries. Now, this should be a bigger picture. This is the Jewish cemetery in Worms. Now, whereas essentially every regular person will be buried in, in a spot where there is a lease of 20, 25, 30 years, renewable, there are certain graves that are never to be removed. They're protected by national law. Two kinds, well, three kinds. Uh, Sinti and Roma, the gypsies, the Jewish graves, because of the terrible treatment many of them received back in the 1930s, in those most heinous days, Jewish graves are permanent monuments, can never be removed. The Jewish people themselves would certainly not do that. Nobody is allowed to remove those or to use the property for any other purpose. The other exception to the temporary burial is military graves. So all soldiers and uh, see, for the most part, there were very few uh, female military members, but there were some. Any soldier's grave of any war is a monument in Germany and cannot be removed. That made it possible for my wife and me to discover the burial place of the supervisor of the West German mission, who was in office from 1939 to 1945, when he was killed by an enemy aircraft, I'll put it that way. He was just a few miles from home, retreating toward his home there in Southwest Germany. And when the enemy came in, uh, he was hit by bullets from a overflying plane and died of pneumonia in a hospital, was buried in a cemetery that was later moved. And when we went there, we interviewed the two daughters in Sacramento who were in their 80s. They said, well, our father was buried in the church by such and such. No, he's not. So we went all over the place asking churches and civil offices 
Finally, they said, well, it's a military grave. It couldn't have been permanently re removed, but it might have been replaced out in the new cemetery at the edge of town, established in the 1950s. We went out there, and sure enough, we found his grave. And we were pleased to be able to tell his daughters where he is now. And I actually took the opportunity to dedicate the grave, believing that nobody else knew where he was. Jewish Cemetery, this is the one I looked down to. Uh, if I'd been really good with a, with a Frisbee, I might have been able to throw the Frisbee from my 12-story balcony across other houses into the cemetery down below. These are Jewish, Jewish graves. They have many memorials there. You go through and you'll think, how could they have so many stones for people who died in 1941, two, three, four, five? Because the people are not buried there. They were victims of of Auschwitz and, and the other four extermination camps. They buried them very, very close together. And then they, they put these wooden structures around there to, so you can plant flowers. And eventually these graves all in the last year will be replaced by monuments. This is an example of the lawn that has fallen in, or the, the grave that has fallen in again uh, it was actually cleared after 20 years, but there's still some activity going on there. And I don't, you know. What about reusing graves? Okay, this is a big, a big question. And I've heard so many outlandish stories by Americans saying, oh, you wouldn't believe this. They'll dig, dig down a grave and, and pull all the bones out and throw them in an ossuary or something. No, because if in fact the coffin can break down in as little as six and eight years. After 30 years, there's nothing left. So I interviewed one cemetery worker who said, well, after 30 years, the people said, we don't want to extend the lease. We're going to give that up. So nothing happens there except the cemetery, if they don't want to take care of themselves because people aren't paying for that care anymore, they'll remove the stone and they'll, t they'll list that as an available plot for anybody else who wants it. So people come along and say, we'll take this plot here. And they might even ask, when was it first used? Oh, it was first used 42 years ago. Well, when they dig down there, there's nothing there. Once in a blue moon, the cemetery worker called me that told me, I might find a piece of the largest bone in the body. The largest bone is the femur, and of course, another large one is the skull. He said, if I do, and the Frankfurt cemetery director backed him up on that. He said, yes, if we actually find something, uh, we'll dig down another 20, 30 centimeters and put it down there and we won't do anything with it. We're not going to take the bones out if there's anything left. We're tiniest shards left and usually nothing because ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This is the one of the of this dear aunt who called me this morning. Gosh, we had such a bad connection. I could hardly express my love to her there. But one day on my annual research trip, I told her I'll be coming in on Thursday night uh, after I leave the archive about an hour and a half away. Came in, she was coming apart at the seams. One of those days where this wonderful lady, let's see, when was that? 1997, she would have been 60, 62, in good health. She said, my whole house is a mess. I don't have your dinner cooked. I haven't vacuumed the floor. I haven't been in the cemetery for a week. And I re realized at that time, she was very close to tears. I said, Marga, I'm not eating one thing here. You're not making me dinner. We're going to the cemetery. It was a gorgeous October afternoon. We went there. And you can always find a stand where there are empty water cans and some rakes and some things like that. But most people bring their own tools, their little hand diggers. And so she went around all these, these flowers very carefully. This was taken on a different occasion. This is not that October afternoon where you'd see a bunch of leaves falling in different places. So she carefully removed every leaf and she made sure every single plant was in order. There might've been a dead leaf there are two on some of these flowers. And then with her leaf rake, with the metal tines, 
she raked the left side and the front in gorgeous rows of gravel. And then she said, everything's fine now. She was relaxed. She was in order. We drove back to her house five minutes away, had a, had a wonderful dinner. I overnighted there and was on my way to the next archive then. But I'll never forget that I haven't been to the cemetery in a week. Well, she's one of those who will be in the cemetery every week. Now she can't drive anymore. So her son, who lives about 300 meters away, can arrange to take her to the cemetery at least once a week, for sure. Oh, I love this one. Was that a bigger... I get that a bigger view. Where was that? Look at this. Now, everybody has their defined place. The people who have who are leasing this spot have have trimmed off their hedges exactly. You can't see the part across here. But look at that. These people haven't trimmed their hedges. Shame on them. What kind of custodianship is that? Look at the hedges over there. Trimmed off, but not that one. Not that one. But these people very carefully trimmed the sides and the top. This is so typically German. We don't have this in the U.S. because we don't have the same conditions of graves like this. What a fabulous example. My dear, dear friends, it was my opportunity a year after my mission to return and be a palace tour guide at Herren Chiemsee. That's the, the one modeled after Versailles on an island between Munich and Salzburg. And on one occasion they said, we're driving up to Kalheim where my parents are buried. That's, that's Franz Wagner, born in, the, in Czechoslovakia. He and his family were kicked out with three million other Germans at the end of World War II by the Czechs who were extremely angry about what had happened. So his parents brought him over there. He was the only son. They died there in 1957. I think the, the father might have died in 1971 or something. But they carefully took care of the grave. Now, this is the only time that during my four months there that they came here. But this was a really educational thing for me. Oh, look at this. In background, that little boy with his little tiny rake. Everybody's getting into the act. It's so totally German. I don't know of a cemetery in the U.S. where you can plant flowers and bushes on the gravesite because they're taken care of by the, the city. And they'll roll right through there. The signs always say, if you bring artificial flowers, you've got to have them out of here by June 1 or we're throwing them away. So, so here's... Franz Wagner and Walter Kusitz, they married in 1958 or so, and they're taking care of his parents' grave. About two hours drive away from their house. Well, we're, we're closing into the end. Now, if you cannot take care of the graves, if you're physically not capable, if you live too far away, you go to this garden. Now, right back here, these trees, uh, pardon me, yeah, these trees, these are all inside the Frankfurt Cemetery, as in this one. So they're right there. You can park your car and go and say, you know something, uh, mom's grave, we need to have you take care of it for a couple of years. What do you charge? And, and you write, you know, fill out a contract. We don't have to follow any services. We want new flowers planted every April, whatever the deal is. And you pay them for them. They, they bill you by the year. So there's always a garden shop there. Friedhof's Gärtnerei, the cemetery nursery. And they've got all these neat things, including other things you can put around to, to decorate the cemetery. Or you just grab a couple flowers here in pots and take them in with you for your one-time visit on All Saints Day in November. Now, this is how it works in Frankfurt with 20 years. And when you just take the cheapest grave you can get, they put you in the ground in chronological order. <clears throat> the sign says, as of April 1 of this year, we can remove these graves. If you don't want them removed, you need to contact us as soon as possible. Contact us by X date to renew the lease. Otherwise, your 20 years are up. And sure enough, these were all, this is a 2022 these were all buried in, in 2002. <clears throat> so, and you can read that all on these inscriptions. One, 
two, three, four, just five graves here. So I came back six months later. No, I came back nearly a year later, eight months later. And this is what you have. So they, I couldn't figure out, I mean, I asked the director, can I be there when they take them out? He says, I can't tell you when our people are going to remove the stones and everything. He says, I have no idea. You can come by every day if you want to see, but I can't tell you what the schedule is. So within eight months, grasses had grown over there. This area will, will be unused for years and years to come, probably 10, 15 years. By the time they go down there, there won't be anything left. So this idea of digging down there and throwing bones in a pile someplace, the technical term for that kind of story is hogwash. Well, what about old stones? <clears throat> the stones are the family's property. You purchase the stone just like you do here. Good heavens, my neighbor has some old limestone things that say nothing but daughter. It's a D-A-U and S-O-M. There are four stones, little tiny ones, not even a, a foot tall uh, in their backyard. I noticed that when I went over to, to uh, do some lawn mowing, they were on a mission in, in Africa. And the cemetery said, hey, you know, get rid of these. I, I'll bet the family organization, family store organization, asked for donations and made real stones to put there for people they had dates for and names for. And uh, my neighbor said, well, I'll take these home, put them in the garden. So these are discarded stones and these big pieces of concrete, these are the borders around the burial plot. And they just threw them in the, in the back corner there. Nobody cares about them. Well, during the 80s and 90s and into the early part of the cemetery, Polish business people, entrepreneurs, would come over with their big trailers, load the stones onto the trailers, take them back to Poland, blast off the inscriptions, and reuse the stones. What a great deal. I asked the Crawford director if that's the case. He said, no, no, no. These things are ground up by diamond grinders, ground up into, into gravel, and used maybe for road base or whatever, things like that. So all kinds of fun ways. And of course, some of the most famous things are in Hallstatt, where you have the Hallstatt culture of the salt mines there uh, southeast of, of Salzburg. You can go into the church and up until 1983, they would wait for a certain number of years and then go in, uh, take the skull out of, I mean, they knew basically how long it's going to take to get into this condition, and then paint the name there, the death year, M. Heuschover. Here's Anna Heuschover, three years earlier, and Barbara Deubler, Franz Deubler. These are all members of the community. Those will be here forever. Then they paint designs on and things. They don't do this anymore. The last time, like I said, was 1973. Uh, my students and I talked to the pastor who showed us the old church books, and talk to us about this. Some people call this bizarre or macabre, but it's a it's a great thing. And people come, they climb the hill from the downtown there where you can no longer drive a car because there's no room for cars for anybody but people actually live there. Climb the hill to the Catholic Church and look at this display. Way, way out at the very end of what used to be East Prussia is a little town called Zellbomen where the LDS church actually owned a church meeting house, the only one in all of Europe. Everybody else leased rooms or other buildings. And in that place where the LDS community and branch actually survived under some rough conditions in 1973, they buried their people there. So when you look at the sign, we looked for this, we walked all around because of uh, it's off the road by 30 or 40 meters, and we've got these grasses growing up, and we couldn't find it. So finally, I went into a store, and I drew a picture. We, I couldn't speak Polish. I drew a picture of a cross, and the guy wrote 250M, 250 meters, and he pointed in the direction. Well, the four of us went out, we went that direction, and waded through the weeds, and sure enough, there it is. And the sign says, these are Mormon, Catholic, 
and Lutheran graves in that or, or, or it said Mormon, Lutheran, and Catholic graves. But the word Mormon was first, and we recognize it, Mormonsky or something like that. Uh, amazing. Now, here's a metal one. Now, the Germans were basically thrown out of here after the war with some. If you were married to a Polish citizen, you were allowed to stay there. But by 1973, the church said, you know, we, it's so hard to take care of your people. So many miles. This is several hundred miles from East Germany. So they didn't get married very often, and we gave up the building. So, and just last, oh, four months ago, the two organs in the building that have been put in here, in there, it's now a Catholic meeting house, were given to our church and taken to Frankfurt. And I believe they'll either be kept there and put on display somewhere or they'll be sent to the United States for the Church History Museum. Here's our last one. So <clears throat> now you're thinking, well, if in fact graves are not maintained in most cases, what good will it do to walk a cemetery? Essentially, very little good. But here's an example of one way where you can use it. This is my friend Bob Fornoff of Columbus, Ohio. 1990, no, 1992 or 91, we made this trip over there to the town we had identified with church records on microfilm. And I told him about the cemetery situation. I said, let's walk the cemetery anyway. We found Forno. Well, what good is that? These people were born uh, after 1870. In fact, it's extremely, this is a good date to remember, extremely difficult to find a cemetery monument of a person born before 1870. And very rarely can you find a person who died in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. So, and those are generally monuments of very rich people whose families have maintained the graves for over 100 years. But this proves that there are still foreign offs living in this town. So it's the next step. Go find them. You find, uh, get them in the Internet or you go to the local library, go to the civil rights store and say, I'm looking for anybody named foreign off. They'll say, oh, well, you know, there's a uh, foreign off. Uh, he's down on, on uh, Bismarck Strauss at 25. And I've knocked on their door to say, you know, here's what we're doing. Uh, I knocked on somebody's door well, in the summer of 22 and asked questions about this kind of stuff. So, yes. And what happens if they have a huge family tree going back to the 1500s? My friend Bob Fornoff uh, could have gained from that immensely. So that's what you can do. Find people with that name today and hope that... The Ludwig and Katharina Fornoff family has, has at least one child who lives close by. Well, what if it's a daughter who's married to a Schmidt? That's going to be tougher. But you talk to the oldest people in town, they'll say, well, those people have, a, have two daughters. One's Schmidt, and they're over there on Bismarck Schlosser. And one is uh, Katharina, and she's married to a Hartmann. And they'll tell you all this stuff. Gosh, I've had people say, should I walk you over there? <laughs> That's great. One guy did actually walk me to another place and, and introduced me to the man at the, at the door and said, this is Dr. Minard. He's here and doing this and that and the other. Well, there we have it. <clears throat> so uh, look through those notes from my interview with the director that will preserve for you a bunch of these details. Uh, if you're in Germany, which I hope you can be or have them done, Go to the local cemeteries, any town your people lived in. Of course, go to the church. Go to inside so you can see the altar where they were baptized and married. Go to the cemetery. Stand in the empty grass spot around the church, a small one, and picture there the resurrection of your ancestors right on that spot. Or the resurrection of Ludwig and Katalin Fornoff on this spot, if the grave is still there. So we don't know everything about the resur resurrection, but we do know that not a hair of the head will be lost when they're brought back to life. I love cemeteries, uh, partially, well, historically, partially culturally, and mostly because this is where the resurrection will take place, and I believe in that with all my heart. So I share these insights and this experience with you. 
and invite you now to make, make your comments, ask questions. I'll stick with you for a while. It's up to you. Okay, great. Well, then, thank you so very much for spending time with us here. And I hope you've gained some insights on, on the importance of cemeteries historically, social, uh, sociologically, demographically, and religiously. It's been great being with you, and I'm sure we'll do this on another topic later on. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on December 7th with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation entitled, Remember Pearl Harbor, Finding Your Ancestors in World War II Military Records. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.